Karthik, I am a founder of a company called Caspida. We won't talk anything about Caspida at all. Beyond this, you won't see anything about Caspida. Just a quick note about who we are. We are a startup based here in Silicon Valley, Series A funded. We've been around uh, for about a year. Before this, I did a company called Cetus, which was in the big data analytics space. And we got acquired by VMware, now part of Pivotal. And Pivotal is the spin out of EMC, Greenplum, and a bunch of divisions that focuses on Hadoop and platform as a service, right? So we got embedded in there as the analytics piece. Um, and all through my time at Cetus, what I found customers asking was when they saw our analytics platform, they said, you know, it's great to be able to get analytics out of everything now because there is this ability to store a lot of data and run Hadoop and all of that. But can you do the same thing for security? So we, that's when we started thinking about this and we said we'll uh, do another company and we're about a year into it. And what we discovered even before we started and even more so now is it's not just feeding data in and getting some standardized output or being able to query something at scale. It is how, can, how deep can you go in terms of correlating seemingly disparate things and bringing them together and saying, hey, there's a guy by name Yuri who's doing a bunch of things here, and how are they correlated? So it can be surfaced up to you saying, this looks abnormal or suspicious. Rather than rely on the old school way of analytics, which is you drive the system to tell you what the answer is, because you know the question. In most cases, especially around security, you don't know what the question is to ask. You don't know to ask, is Yuri going to this web server and copying files from here to there and going to Dropbox? How many such queries are you going to write? Whereas if you were told there's somebody who's doing something extremely abnormal compared to the behavior of the, themselves in the past, as well as their peer groups, then it becomes interesting. Then I have a starting point and then I can go deeper and then I can go investigate. I still have to investigate, but at least I get to know what the top 10 things are that I need to worry about rather than start from scratch and start writing queries to analyze. So I think we are at a point in the industry where we are clearly seeing a transition from the human driven analytics approach to security to a more algorithmic approach to security where the system through its algorithms knows enough to propagate up or surface up certain things. Now of the 10 things that it surfaces, maybe eight are good and two are false positives, that's fine. That's why you need a feedback loop so it's a self-learning mechanism so it goes back and the next time a false positive like the same uh, one that came up before happens, it knows enough to correct itself, right? So broad message here is I think we are transitioning and I'm speaking strictly security from a uh, human analytics driven approach to one of a more algorithmic automated approach where I have a starting point, right? That's where I think uh, the world is going. And many people ask and debate and you know, why now? And uh, you know, I could have thought of this 10 years ago. Sometimes you just have to wait for the technology to catch up with your ideas. And I think the time is now Hadoop is mainstream. People are not worried about putting Hadoop in their infrastructures. Um, you know, there are machine learning algorithms that have always existed. It's not a new thing, but we are able to at scale run these things and correlate and you know, work on billions of objects, right? That's what's happening. So that's why I think the timing is now. The ideas, you know, have existed, but the timing is now. So that, that's the topic. So here's what I, I will cover. I'll do my best, but it may be even better if as I go through this, if you have any questions, please, you know, even as I go through, you don't have to wait for Q&A at the end. I would be happy to take um, uh, questions along the way. So here's what I'm going to cover really quickly, and then we'll, uh, you know, maybe have some more discussions toward the end. So why did I pick security? By the way, this most of what I'm discussing here today is uh, from my presentation at the Hadoop Summit that, that happened in the San Jose Convention Center a couple of months ago. I don't know if anyone was in the Hadoop Summit at all or saw this presentation. So a couple. So this is kind of uh, similar to that. I've got a lot of requests from people who registered here as well as back at the uh, Hadoop Summit to replay the presentation. It is available on YouTube as well. But I have a good chunk of that content here. So that's what I'm going through. 
Again, why this topic became interesting was because everybody's worried about security. When we started this company, the NSA Snowden thing was just about getting started. So we kind of picked the right time, I think, to you know, think about security. But that's what's kind of triggered off everything. It's a series of high profile hacks. And what is evident clearly is it's no longer the old you know, brute force type of attack that we are seeing these days. These are very carefully planned, well-funded, state-sponsored sometimes. So these are getting pretty professional. And there are people who are paid to do this. It's not a hobby. It's not like, hey, let me see you break, break into Bank of America. This has become a business, right? That's what's changed, too, in the last couple of years. And if you think about it, the attackers need one or two times to be successful. The defenders, we need to be successful 100% of the time. So we really need to be much more at the top of our game than they need to, right? I mean, that's the, so that's why security is important. So this applies uni universally, horizontally, and the world of security today is all about incident analysis mainly. You are told, hey, I'm Home Depot right now today. I've been told that I, you know, much of my stuff has been hacked into. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back, take six months worth of logs from the past and start investigating. That's the best I can do. So the whole world revolves around incident analysis. True, there are some situations where proactively you catch something, but you know that's typically using known rules or known signatures, right? That's always reactive, because when does it become known when someone else caught it? It's like airport security, right? Now we all remove our shoes because there's a problem with shoes. But five years ago, whenever it was, we never did that. So that's what the world is at right now, is working based on known things. That's incident analysis. Anomaly detection, you mentioned this just before. It's a huge topic. Anomaly detection is one of those things that can, go, that, can be, that can be completely great or can flood you with things that you just cannot manage. So general purpose anomaly detection is never going to work anywhere. It has got to be very context specific because just sitting here in this room, and if I had all of your mobile data right now and if I can go through it, I can tell you 100 anomalies. How important are those anomalies really? Is anyone going to take any action? Maybe one or two of them become threats. And that's how we model our whole product. Not that we're talking about our product, but I'm saying that's how we have to do it is there's going to be always billions of events. You've got to take it through a funnel. You've got to filter it down based on anomaly detection to maybe you know a, a, a tenth of that in terms of anomalies. And then a further very small chunk is one, what is going to emerge is real threats that you want to take action on. So anomaly detection, huge concept, but we have to know how to apply. Queries at scale, this goes back to my previous point about why now. Hadoop allows us to be like this today. I mean, we can do things at scale and commodity hardware, so we're not going to spend millions on storage costs and SAN costs and all of that. Predetermined metrics, this one's a bit questionable. It's important, but, you know, it's like having KPIs in the business world, right? I mean, all businesses have KPIs. So if you talk about e-commerce, they will talk about customer retention, loyalty, time on site, and things like that. If you talk to ad tech, advertising, they talk about CPCs, conversions, impressions. Everybody's got metrics that they measure their business by. Similarly, in the security world, I call them indicators of compromise or metrics. For example, how many bad logins today, and what are the what are my top ten? You know, who are my top ten users by volume? There are some telltale things about uh, indicative about the state of your security that you want to know. So this is like a CISO or a CIO type thing. I want to see a dashboard of all of my key metrics because if all of them are in the green, at least I know the basics of my security are okay, and then I'll go get my cup of coffee. But if the dashboard has a bunch of reds in it, right? that's what that means. That's important. And that's important in this context for this audience here is because this is real time. You've got to have a real time engine too to be able to pull these metrics and do some quick aggregations and display because this is really important. This cannot be uh, end of day jobs running. This has got to be real time. So think Storm and you know concepts like that. Self-learning, we'll talk about that more. That's really important. I find myself updating this slide almost every two days. Um, until last week, I didn't have Home Depot on it. Until two weeks before, no iCloud or Apple on it. Until three weeks before, no JP Morgan Chase. Keeps changing. The point about this is JP Morgan Chase, for instance, is a gold standard of cybersecurity. I mean, they spend millions, literally. And I used to work for Goldman Sachs, and we were exactly like that. And Goldman continues to be like that. 
Um, but if these guys themselves can be breached, you know, there's something to be said about hackers and their sophistication. So I think we need to shift our focus. And I was telling Yuri this, is, uh, this morning, I was presenting at a CIO forum. Um, there was a breakfast gathering of about 40 local CIOs, and I presented to them this very concept, um, a bit more on the product side than the Hadoop side. The message was, you know, you have the old enterprise, which was perimeter pr protected by a perimeter. That's why you had firewalls and intrusion prevention systems and malware detection or antivirus type companies, because that whole concept was my enterprise is within four walls or a circle, uh, a perimeter. And if I can have a very nice perimeter, my enterprise is more or less secure. But that's really broken, not just because hackers are breaking in, but also because there is no perimeter anymore. We sit here and we work. We are not inside a firewall. Some of us are out on you know, the cloud, right? I mean, there's no you know, VPN in. So we, our perimeter is really shattered. So what's the concept of this old firewall and malware detection and all of that? Consider your network exposed already. So how are you going to protect it? That's why the new paradigm really is is no matter how protected your perimeter is, let's work inside your network and figure out patterns and anomalies and behaviors that are changing. That will be indicative of threats. Rather than say, hey, this bad signature is coming in, let me block it. It could be a bad signature. You just don't know it is bad yet. Let it come in, and once it does things, anomalous activities, then you are able to arrest it. So sometimes it could be blocked, sometimes it could be catch it before it wreaks havoc, right? So if you, I, I have a couple of um, uh, market surveys here that people uh, have done. This one was a Barclays um, uh, report uh, polling several CIOs. If I read it right, it's the Barclays and KPMG um, CIO and CFO survey. The results of it, big data problems and security. Everybody's tying big data and security together because one, CIOs have realized at this point that they are no longer going to curtail the amount of data being created, nor are they going to cur curtail the proliferation of devices. Right? People are not locking down saying you cannot bring your own device. People are more open. So what that leads to is big data problems. Everybody's generating data. Everybody's got apps. And if you think about it, apps are where a lot of openness can come in. Right? You don't know the quality of the app. So therefore, people are tying big data to security, right? That's where all of your uh, vulnerabilities are coming from. And this um, Verizon uh, incident, DBIR is what it's called, Data Breach and Incidents Report. They do this every year, and Verizon's got, you know, as a service provider, a lot of data. So they are privy to breach activity and all of that. And this is a 60-page report uh, that came out a couple of months ago. And if anybody wants to reach out to me to get a copy of it, I'd be happy to. But you should be able to find it on the internet, too. Just look for Verizon 2014 breach report. It's really good reading for whoever is interested even remotely in security. And this is one of the pictures I got from it. I modified it a little bit. The idea represented by them here was um, a comparison between the, num the ratio of comparison between the number of days it takes for an attacker to successfully attack and the number of days it takes for the defender to find the attack and stop it. That number of days, that was a proportion, so this was a proportion on the left, is widening, which means the attackers are getting in faster, defenders are slower in catching up, which means we significantly have to up the game as well-funded as they are we have to be as well. And we have the tools. We just need to make this a profession as opposed to just extending the old world of you know, firewalls and other things. We really have to think through, hey, the paradigm has shifted. Not only has the perimeter broken, but the attackers are getting more sophisticated. So it's time for a next gen of any security tool that you think of today. Because if you think of any security product you have in your environment, chances are it's 10-year-old technology. Take the, even the gen firewalls, they are 10-year-old companies. You think of you know, any of your new, recently went uh, public uh, malware detection companies, they are 10 years old. You think of any SIM product, as we were talking about earlier, 10 years old. I'm going to a SIM conference right after this in Washington. SIEM, by the way, Security Information and Events Management Products. I'm not naming any. These are good products. You're not going to do away with them. That's not the message. The question is you've got to augment them. 
with newer things because these guys are all from a different world, right? It's an old gen. The next gen needs to augment this, right? So that's the takeaway from this report. The, uh, this one was done by Mary Meeker, who used to be on Wall Street when I was at Goldman Sachs. She was a JP Morgan Chase, if I'm not, or uh, Morgan Stanley investment banker, and she's now with Kleiner Perkins. So she does uh, uh, annual studies on the, uh, the, on the market. And this particular one, she included quite a bit on security, right? I mean, the, she hasn't done that before. And this one was good in that this is an internet study. She was an internet specialist in the 90s. Um, and then uh, she covers, she's, this is like a 100 slide deck, of which a couple were about security. And it goes to show how security has become top of mind for executives, right? You saw Target, the CEO, you know, resigned. The CIO was in trouble, obviously. So this is at a very high level. So, so much so that people are creating audit committees, which are spin-offs from the board specific to um, security assessment. The CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, has become more powerful and has line management duties now, more so than before, where the CISO was usually, if at all there was a CISO, the CISO's job was really to do policies and procedures and governance. Now they have line management capabilities, which means they have people reporting to them, they run the SOCs, security operation centers, and they are buying tools. They have budget for buying tools. So, with that said, uh, we will jump into a little bit of why current methods fail. I think we talked about it a bit. First of all, signature-based approaches, right? I mean, you only are as good as the signatures you have, right? I mean, that's like fingerprints in a police record. A new criminal is not gonna have a record from before. Rules, rules are good, but they take you only so far. You have to create so many exceptions to rules because the mode of entry for attackers is different every day. There could be known malware sites in known regions of the world that change IP addresses every two days. You just can't keep up with it anymore. So rules are not gonna work. They're only gonna take you so far. You have to have self-learning algorithmic approaches. That's what we're gonna talk about. Finally, malware detection. Again, a necessary but not sufficient condition because malware objects are becoming increasingly more sophisticated. They have the ability to morph code when they execute at runtime which means you can do all the code checks you want, but when they run, you have no idea what's gonna happen. Somebody just recently mentioned to me, I think it was last week or you know, one of the weekend uh, social events, that a game like Candy Crush, I'm not sure if it was Candy Crush or a game like it. In any case, the, that, that was a harmless game. People had it on their uh, devices and it had run through code checks, but when you get to level 31 or 32, it explodes and does nasty things. And that's the sort of thing you can never check, right, in a code. Level 32, what's it gonna do? No one knows that sort of thing, right? So applications are your weak point. So if you think you have detected a malware object because it has certain properties such as a signature, or even when you put it in a sandbox and run it and see how it executes and see what URLs it calls, when it actually executes real code and does something in a different situation, its operations are gonna be entirely different. So that's why, despite all of these, your network is still gonna get breached. And not to mention insiders who don't come through any of these, but are just people. Right? I have, for the CIOs, I had a different pie chart, which was a study that showed two thirds of, peop of uh, breaches and uh, data uh, uh, being stolen was attributed to insiders, two thirds. And here we are talking about the remaining one third through all of these methods, but two thirds are insiders, none of these things catch. So the one universal thing that's gonna address all of these, I'm not saying we're gonna solve the problem this way completely, but we're gonna get a good deal of progress done is by watching activities inside the network and tracking a normal and tracking abnormalities and then correlating that to reduce the false positives. A behavior-based approach is simply what it's gonna to take to be the next-gen approach to catch security breaches. None of these other guys will be successful. It has to be a behavior approach inside the network, right? Watching everything happen. So why is this a big data problem? Again, this goes back to the why now we're able to handle it. It is a big uh, data problem because first of all, the variety of data, right? Not just the volume. Volume, we all understand. It's you know, big data, but the variety here, and specifically in the, because we're dealing with a lot of security data, we're experiencing this um, firsthand. 
You know, if I go and get some Active Directory event data, for instance, or even network packets, or I go get some VPN client data for remote user uh, behavior uh, monitoring, each one of these is different. I mean, the Cisco 5.3 VPN client versus the 5.4 has different things happening in it. The variety is just immense. So, you know, taking that guesswork out and having a broader schema in which you can dump all of these security events and being able to make some sense in correlations is a, is a, big, is a big deal. The relationships amongst the data for security is really important. It, you have to really understand who a user is and what the relevance is when they go through a certain port or to an FTP site. Each has its significance. It's not a general purpose you know, uh, algorithm. It's very fine-tuned for security events. The sophistication of analysis is key because much of what you will find, you can find anomalies when you run certain algorithms, but you'll get thousands of anomalies a day. You know, if you're lucky, only a, only a few thousand. But you have to derive certain di the dynamic correlations from beyond those anomalies so you can boil it down to a few threats that I can actually take some action on. Because what good is a couple of thousand threats? This is what most of our customers say is, today I get thousands of alerts from all of my products. What am I going to do? That's, that leads to what they call analyst fatigue, which means I see thousands of it every day. I know I'll never catch up, so I'm going to cherry pick a few things that look interesting, solve them, and go home. Right? So dynamic correlations, and the word dynamic often you know, kind of uh, overused, really important because, I'll take a simple example. If I have a certain number of failed uh, login attempts through some VPN server, for instance, it may be okay, um, and not all failed attempts may be bad, but on a certain day of the week at a certain time of the hour, that number may have a different normal. So if you ever have a rule saying anything about 25 failed logins alert me, on Monday evenings you may get alerts to Wazoo and maybe for a Monday evening that's the norm. So you have to have a self-learning dynamic correlative capability where it's not a one size fits all at all. On a Monday evening, maybe the day, week off earnings announcement you're gonna see a lot more and that's normal, don't panic. But if it doesn't drop by Friday, then that's abnormal, then you can panic, right? So that's what dynamic means and you have to be able to recognize these in the algorithms. The third and final one on this, at least in this context, is a really important one. So APTs, advanced persistent threats. These are extremely you know, sophisticated attacks. And what happens here is APTs have this tendency to um, enter a network, look for the weak point of the network, and then they stay dormant for a period of time, which could be weeks or even months. Then they have some low-grade activity, which your you know, static rules may never catch because it's within the norm. And then they go dormant again, and they may, they may act up. Now, if you're going to be looking from an incident analysis standpoint or sim product standpoint, 30 days, 60 day windows, which is all people do, you're never going to catch an APT because it has patterns outside of your window of collection and analysis. And that's why having a Hadoop kind of a data store lets you put everything in. Because at some point you want to go back in time and say, I saw that pattern six months ago and I see it again now. There is a correlation and make, take some action on it. That's the only hope we have to catch things like APTs. So that context of time is really important. And this is again enabled by Hadoop and the data store behind it. So, um, you know, we talked about this already. I'll just mention what's missing. And this is the core of what I think we all should be looking at is a dynamic self-learning algorithmic approach, which is able to look at billions of events every day and derive correlations from it. And when, a, when there is a false positive, learn it back because today I could do 50 logins as a sysadmin, maybe I just got newly hired. So the first, second day that you know, something like our algorithm runs, it's gonna say uh, Karthik has a bunch of threats because he's accessed 50 different systems and 50 different geos with the same ID. Certainly looks bad. But after a week of time, these algorithms should be able to tell, wait a minute, this guy does this every day. He must do this for a living. So the next week, it shouldn't really alert whoever anymore about this, right? Um, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. That's what is needed because if constantly I have to go correct it or supervise it, uh, it doesn't scale. There will be situations, however, where you may have to supervise some of these algorithms and say, 
you know, anytime you see this in future, ignore it. This guy is allowed to do random things. That, that always happens. You have to, but that's only in a knowledgeable environment where somebody knows the meaning of supervising something, right, and the implication of it. But for the most part, you want this to be dynamic and self-learning. So this fine tunes itself over time. Today's norm for CPU utilization could be 70%. Tomorrow, as your company has grown and more data is being crunched or whatever it is, 80% could be your norm. This guy has to be able to take all of that and you don't want to go and um, say today use 80%. So this is a slide my co-founder and CTO put together. It's, it's a bunch of builds. I know, I know you cannot read this. Um, what it's saying is the attack sophistication has gone up significantly. And he's put down a bunch of things here. For example, you know, it was just about password ha hashing to antivirus to, you know, uh, uh, things that can be handled by disk encryption, et cetera. But now the whole level up there is polymorphic APTs and botnets, polymorphic, that's the code changing thing I was talking about. That's where the world is. And so, you know, we've really got to go, you know, to track that same curve and say, if we are still doing antivirus and anti-malware type things and we're not doing anything polymorphic related, then clearly, yes, we are going to be lagging behind, right? If they are so advanced, we've got to be too. That's, uh, he presents it way better than I do, so. So here's where we are. If you look at a kill chain, as they call it, of stages of an attack, much of the world is really in the second stage of infiltration, which is in green. This is where people are focused on where am, where am I letting breaches come in or attacks come in or malware come in, et cetera. What they are failing to, 86% of enterprises, Poneyman study along with HP uh, this year, I think. Where we are missing the ball uh, on completely is the stages three and four. Five is really outside the company. This is where people sell what they stole, right? I mean, this is like, um, credit card numbers being stolen, then they go outside to a black market where they sell it for $10 a pop, and as time uh, goes, the value of the you know, uh, credit card goes down, down to a dollar or a few cents. That's outside, it. Uh, that's outside. At that point, the data's already been stolen. Forget about that. But stages three and four are well within the enterprise, within your control, and this is where we need to have algorithms in place that detect patterns that look like, say, beaconing, which means you know, com communicating uh, externally in a heartbeat kind of a pattern. Uh, you gotta be looking at things like lateral movement. You gotta be thinking uh, things like ground speed violations. And I'll talk about a couple of those examples, but these are the kinds of things that your algorithm should be trying to catch, saying, I see some capture behavior. I see some exfiltration behavior. And if, if we do that, we'll be hugely successful at arresting the stealth of data, meaning data exfiltration. Infiltration, I think we are only, we are as good as we can be. I mean, we have got to continue to do what we do today. I don't think we can get any better. There's always going to be a new attack you didn't know before that's going to penetrate, or there's going to be a malicious insider sitting in the room who's going to do something bad that you're not going to catch. That's okay. But let's at least try to do more in stages three and four with algorithms. At least you can arrest the bad things that will happen later, right? Which will be data exfiltration or privacy loss. That's where these algorithms should be focused. So when I say algorithms, I mean two kinds of things. One is completely machine learning, self-learning, et cetera, and the other is statistical oriented. Both are equally important. There's no trade-off. Both work hand in hand. The one thing I will stress, and this is why we have a group of security data scientists in our company, not just general purpose data scientists, who, who will be great too, but you really need to be able to correlate entities um, so that first stage of a data scientist's work as they feed into their algorithms is really entity extraction, right, from all of the data. That has got to be really clean. It has to be semantically aware of security terms, and that will dictate the power behind the algorithms. You can't apply a general random forest algorithm to any problem. You will get some results. They may be meaningful, but you really need a data scientist to interpret that too for you. So you really need something more well-tuned. I put down names of standard models for, you know, just to highlight that these models exist, but you cannot just dream of putting these models in and getting answers tomorrow. You really have to have it fine-tuned. So entity extraction is key. What data sources are you going to feed in? I don't know if I have a slide on that. Let me quickly check. No. But I'll, 
what data sources are you going to feed in? This is very important. So when we started our company, we said we'll start with some identity and authentication data. So we wrote a bunch of models for just that data, which means I get a user ID, I get time of login, and all of that. Think AD, single sign-on, and all of that. VPN is an example. Then we said, what about activities? First class was identity authentication. Second class is activity. What am I doing? Once I'm logged in, what am I doing? Uh, so that telltale sign really is HTTP data, right? Um, from your uh, web gateway, proxy, proxy servers. Uh, it can be your um, uh, load balancer in some cases, firewall, right? Internal firewalls too, because in, inside networks have firewalls amongst them too. One network may or may not be able to talk to another. So, they, so these are all activity sources. You don't need all of them. You can start with a few. And then you have SaaS and mobile data sources. This is really important. This is the new enterprise, right? It's no longer inside a perimeter. So if I'm a remote user, or if I use uh, salesforce.com, or I move data to Dropbox, who's tracking that? That's not in my network. It may or may not go through a proxy, right? I could sit at home from my ISP's connection, go to the company salesforce.com account, and download a document, and move it to Dropbox. No one from the corporate um, knows that, right? I mean, you've got to have methods to track it. So that's, that's all key. So depending on those data sources, your models will vary, and they will do different things. And then you correlate that with the statistical models too, which you know, tell you what's the average, what's the norm, and things like that. Together is what the power comes from. And ideally, you don't want this to be a piecemeal too. You really want everything running on top of what we call a security data lake, running on Hadoop. The algorithms run on top. You could have a real-time infrastructure on Storm on top of that too for those metrics that I talked about. Then you have the visualization layer above. The visualization layer is really for the user to communicate. The power lies in the model, uh, the, the layers beneath. So that's kind of a, a high level. Now, um, I mentioned the stages of an attack, but if you drill down into the stages one level, uh, it's called a kill chain. And what typically happens, and this is where algorithms have to be tailored to the kill chain as we know it. Kill chains change too, so that's where the algorithms need to evolve. But in this well-known kill chain, what's happening is how does somebody enter, first of all? Most common entry point is phishing attacks, which means an email seemingly looking innocuous or even attractive with an embedded link in it or an attachment. Uh, I think at this point, most users know not to download or open an executable. We've all been well-trained. But a website that looks like a payroll website with a link saying, check here for your pay increase, 80% of people will click on. This morning at the CIO forum, uh, one of the CIOs said that they do routine checks and training for their audience, for their uh, internal users. And they had a training exercise where the link said, clicking here may download a virus to your machine. 20% of their employees clicked on it, reading that. 20% explicitly stated. So if you think about a Bank of America-like site, you and I would click on it, right? So that's the number one way something enters the network. So you're never gonna stop it at entry point is the point. So what happens next is that guy here that's entered is gonna look for ways to proliferate, right? That's the job. The next thing they're going to, that's what is called a backdoor entry, and then the lateral movement follows where, and this is exactly what happened at Target, the HVAC contractor who ultimately was responsible for the stealth of all of those credit cards of, uh, on an entirely different network, already had access, so they didn't have to go through a phishing attack. They already had access, contractor access, but on a different network, protected by a firewall, a, from the other networks, they were able to find a weak point to laterally move from one network to another. Lateral movement also transforms identity. So when an identity here, and this is something we catch in our product, as an instance, we did this for a financial services customer last week. Um, when you log in, you can, if you have admin privileges, you can run another application as another user. And at that point, your logging with your user ID has stopped and the logging of a different account has started, right? There's no correlation. Those are the kinds of things you need to be able to detect and say, hey, I see a lateral movement. I see this guy walked into a store and never came back out. Instead, another guy wearing a different hat came out, right? You've got to correlate the two and say, that's the same guy in disguise, right? That's as simple as what this concept is, lateral movement. As they move laterally, that's how the HVAC vendor came to the point of sale system and got what he or she wanted. 
That's the data gathering phase. And finally, the exfiltration, which is also a stage. It's not too late. You can catch it there as well. Oops. I don't know what time it is. So anyone? I'm supposed to be done by 12.30. It is 12.30. OK. I heard, uh, no, so maybe a couple more minutes. I do want to conclude on, you know, what's the uh, takeaway? Very simplistic, but this is not really as simple as it is going to be. I talked about e-commerce and ad tech. One thing I will um, say is, from a credibility standpoint, we're not talking black magic through machine learning algorithms. I wish I had more time. I have a slide on algorithms. Um, this has been done before. So when e-commerce, think about ad tech, think about e-commerce, they know who you are. When you come from a mobile device, when you come back on a browser, on a laptop, they know who you are. They provide you the right ads and they connect the dots. Why can't we do the same for security within the enterprise, right? We can. It's the same technology. The contexts are different. So, you know, it's really important. And this is, uh, you know, I think I talked about some of these before, um, you know, how um, things happen. There's something called a watering hole attack. In fact, we, for our company, we put a watering hole together too. It's, it's also called a honey pot, where you attract people to a place from where, you know, you disseminate bad things. Uh, I think we talked about a lot of this, so I'll, I'll skip. I'm almost toward the end. I won't have time to cover this. This kind of walks through an anatomy uh, of, a, of, a, of an attack where the correlative capabilities of the algorithm are really important. So you have IP addresses. I talked about um, identity and authentication. You get that. Correlate that with some other data coming from your DNS, DHCP servers, perhaps, because then you know who's tied to what IP address, so you can now bring it down to a user. So you can go like that and tie it to three, four, or five sources. You don't, have, you don't need the whole enterprise's data. You really need to know the key data sources, and you'll get 80% of you know, what you don't know before. So you know, it's, it's a good uh, um, example to walk through. So uh, some folks after the Hadoop Summit thing asked, where do you really start? So quickly put something together. First of all, you need to be good at collecting data. So things need to be logging, right? So frequently what I'm finding is, because we are in the business, people log things when there are errors. You really need to log transactions. That means homegrown applications need to be logging quite a bit. Um, your other devices need to be logging quite a bit. So th then you're in the stream of it. You don't rely on logs. You really want to be in the event stream or network packet inspection, right? The bottom line is don't rely on the logs because the logs are not complete. And then on top of that analytics, which is automated, self-learning, and statistical approaches. Finally, you want to tie it down to recommendations and actions too, because highlighting a problem is rarely sufficient. You want to provide a recommendation, which means you tie the source of the problem to the recommendation. So you got to identify the problem, tie the source to the recommendation, which means it could be as simple as um, this user is definitely 99% malicious. So recommendation could be sh to shut off the AD account or whatever, exchange account or whatever, right? Those are the you know, easy actions. And when I speak to a lot of CIOs, they are saying the security of an organization is way more important than the inconvenience I might cause to somebody briefly by arresting their uh, you know, workflow. I would rather take that risk, right? And so if that be the case, then we should think about tying actions to some of our findings that will make our solutions more complete. Simplistic as they may be, but people are more open to, in this world of security breaches, they're definitely open to, I don't mind if you know, John complains to me for five minutes that his email was not sent, but I'd rather his email not be sent than some data being exfiltrated out, right? So that's... So I'm almost kind of at the tail end. I skipped a couple of slides. I think uh, the one slide that I um, you know, might have gone through in more detail, but I'm happy to do later, is there's a bunch of algorithms right, which could apply. And the key is the correlative capabilities and the semantically um, aware um, entity extraction. That's what is key in all of these. So I, I won't go through all of this, but, and I'm, I'm not a CTO type guy either to go through this in more detail, but these are what we might want to be thinking of. There's a bunch of standard things available. You don't have to start from scratch, but fine tuning it and making sure 
that we catch some of those behavioral properties with these as base is important. I would never suggest that you just take a random package of algorithms and run it on your data. You won't know what to make out of it. So it really has to be fine-tuned. That said, um, I can be contacted um, at karthik at caspida.com. Um, let me see if I have something. C-A-S-P-I-D-A. -S Happy to take any questions or comments offline. Um, my first name, Karthik, at caspida.com. Just feel free to email me. I'd be happy to you know, engage. All right, thank you for your patience, and uh, thanks.